Back tonight, Taiki on In Focus. On to this night was a grisly murder of a former Rwandan spy in South Africa, Patrick Karagea, in 2013. It prompted author and journalist Michaela Rong uh, to write her book, Do Not Disturb. The former intelligence uh, chief had left Rwanda for South Africa after falling out with the Rwandan government after being imprisoned twice. Now, once in South Africa, he formed the Rwandan National Congress uh, to take on uh, Kagame's administration, a source of, we of much rather information uh, for journalist Michaela Rong. Uh, his death would become the inspiration to expose the Rwanda behind the mask. The author of Do Not Disturb, Michaela Rong, joins us now uh, to share more about the book and its meaning. Michaela, good evening and thank you very much for your time and joining us uh, tonight mm -hmm. uh, here on In Focus. I mean, when we hear the story of, of Rwanda, many are looking at the story of uh, uh, post-genocide Rwanda where uh, a group of young rebels overthrew the brutal regime in Kigali, ushering in a, a, a new era of peace and, and stability which is what really uh, is the picture. Uh, are you saying this is far from the, from the truth, considering uh, the, the kind well, of sinister uh, right uh, story that you write in this book? Well, I'm, I'm a journalist who spent some time reporting on Rwanda after the genocide and went there quite a few times, got to know members of the, the, the ruling uh, elite. And I think uh, the way I would describe it is it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a white stone and then you lift the stone up and there are all these maggots crawling out, uh, underneath. And Patrick Caragaya's murder in the Michelangelo, he was strangled there by a squad that had almost certainly been sent from um, Kigali, but on the orders of the president, Paul Kagame. I think that really showed you the reality of, of, of what is happening in Rwanda. Yes, it's been rebuilt after this horrific genocide. Uh, yes, it has a, a very impressive sort of city center, lots of skyscrapers and some impressive statistics. But there is this, um, this track record of brutal repression. And one of the things Rwanda does, which is really unusual in Africa and anywhere in the world really, is it sends out um, intelligence operatives to take out critics of the, re the regime that are seen as the threats to Paul Kagame. Patrick Karagai was one of those. There's also been General Kayumba Nyamwasa, who is under guard here in South Africa, who has got a bullet in his back from where the, an assassination attempt was made on him in 2010. So um, this is the other side of the Rwandan regime, and it is ignored rather too often, I think, by politicians here in Africa and especially in, in the West and in, in Britain where I come from. What is the turbulent reality of, of Rwanda in the perspective of uh, Patrick Karagai? Well, the perspective of um, Patrick Karagai was someone who was really a very, very close to Kagame. He was his head of external intelligence. He'd actually known him most of his life. He'd been to school with him in Uganda. Uh, their families knew one another. He had fought again uh, alongside him as a young rebel in Uganda and had then invaded Rwanda in 1990. Um, um, Kagame invaded and later called uh, Karagai to help him out. Um, and, and hid his intelligence services. So um, Patrick Carragher knew the system really well, and he had become very disillusioned with it. He felt that there was um, more and more power being concentrated in Kagame's hands, uh, that the uh, Tutsi elite was um, uh, monopolizing power and didn't really want to share with the, uh, the Hutu majority, um, and that there was this personality cult building and that um, Kagame didn't, did not intend to ever share power. Um, and I think what happened to him in the Michelangelo in Santon, you know, his, his death in that lurid um, way uh, shows you just how ruthless Kagame is towards anyone who dares stand up to him. We've seen this in many different cases. And he will reach out across Africa, into Uganda, into Kenya, uh, and also into Europe and North America. For example, he uh, organized the renditioning of Paul Rousseff Abagina, the uh, hotel manager who, uh, whose story was made into a film, Hotel Rwanda. So <clears throat> Kagame does not hesitate to reach out and, and, um, and find his enemies. And either he silences them by assassinating them or he intimidates them or he gets them back into Rwanda. And uh, Paul Rousseff Abagina is serving a 25-year jail sentence now. Yeah. In putting together this book, were you ever concerned about um, uh, how, how critically 
uh, reviewed, I suppose, in some quarters, this particular book is going to be. And that, what was the process that you had followed uh, in, in terms of making sure that the, the facts are legitimate, uh, that uh, they, are, they are credible, and that the reader uh, will, will, will probably be getting the, the, the true story, not the misconceptions that have been created? Well, it's always uh, difficult with this kind of story. The uh, crude details of Patrick Karagaya's um, murder have been um, made public, though, here in South Africa during his inquest. Um, and, you know, there were arrest warrants issued by a Randberg um, court for two Rwandans who have fled back into Rwanda, who the Hawks had said uh, were linked to the Rwandan government. Um, so after a five-year delay in that court case, um, it, they, there were still these two arrest warrants issued. They've been sent to Interpol and these extradition uh, requests are there and the Rwandans are not responding to them. There is an awful lot of evidence in the public domain. Human Rights Watch, um, uh, Amnesty International, Freedom House, these are all human rights groups that have, uh, have um, made public these, these concerns, these, these deaths that, um, that happen in uh, mysterious circumstances and, and the details of those assassinations and also many disappearances. So there, there is a lot that is out there. Uh, and what my book does is, is pull it together uh, and also explain by talking to many of the people who have been targeted, you know, how they fell out with the regime, how they fell out with Paul Kagame and why they feel that he has targeted them. Um, but obviously, when you're writing a book about something as controversial as this, you will always get um, pushback. And I, I've certainly had a lot of pushback from the Rwandan government, which has um, um, it took, it taken issue not so much with the allegations I make of um, assassinations and disappearances uh, and extrajudicial killings, but it's taken issue with me uh, and accused me of all sorts of things, including being a genocide denier, which I certainly am not. Yeah. How close did you have to be to things in order for you to put together a book of this nature? Um, how, sorry, I didn't catch I'm it. I'm saying how close did you have to be to the situation uh, and, and to, the, to the experiences and the, the realities that were happening at the time to be able to yeah. put together this book? Well, I, I, I have spoken to um, the victims as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, they now uh, all live the, the, the targets of Kagame's uh, operations. Um, they're living in exile, and the ones who have been targeted, um, they were happy to go on the record. Of course, there are a lot of other people who are afraid of Kagame who don't want to go on the record, and they will only talk to you uh, anonymously, and that was frustrating because it meant I had to quote them anonymously, and, of course, that undermines the credibility of what you're, you're saying. But I spent a lot of time interviewing and re-interviewing people um, uh, uh, outside Rwanda because, of course, I was very, it was very clear to me that inside Rwanda I wasn't going to be able to get people to talk openly because there's such an atmosphere of fear in that country. Yeah. So, I mean, would, would you say in the narrative currently out there there's a lot of uh, revision, revisionism and, and the downplaying of the genocide? Um, uh, I, I think there, there are all sorts of things going on. There are attempts um, uh, to downplay the reality of the genocide. I was one of the journalists who covered the genocide, so I would never uh, want to do that. But I think there's also an attempt uh, by the regime in Kigali to downplay its own uh, human rights record, including uh, for the Rwandan Patriotic Front seize power in Kigali, and also what happened in the forests of eastern Congo in the late 1990s when the, uh, the RPF and the rebel group that it was supporting slaughtered tens of thousands of Hutu refugees who had fled into that country after the genocide. Some of them had blood on their hands and had, had taken part in the genocide, but many of them were innocent civilians, men, um, sorry, women, children, old people, and they were hunted down and slaughtered. So there's revisionism and at attempts at revisionism being made on all sides of this story, I'm afraid. Yeah. As far as you know, what has happened to, 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 to those who were found guilty or a, at least directly linked uh, to the killing of uh, Patrick Karagai? Well, um, they are, uh, are in Rwanda. There are these two arrest warrants. They have not been... Um, extradited to South Africa, and I don't think they will be as long as uh, Paul Kagame is running the country because, of course, um, the first thing they would do if they were extradited and asked to give um, evidence in court is they would then identify who sent them to the Michelangelo Hotel in Santon to carry out that job. So I don't think we're going to be seeing them in South Africa any day soon. Yeah.
What, what do you think would be achieved, I suppose, by yourself uh, uh, injecting this human angle into, into this narrative and into this story? Well, I think um, it, uh, it, for outsiders, it's often very difficult to understand the Rwandan story. It is complex. It is toxic. Um, it often seems very depressing because so many people have died in that country and also in neighboring countries. Uh, and I think um, you, can, you have to give it a human face. And by giving it a human face, it becomes comprehensible. The people I'm mostly talking about were former members of the Rwandan elite. They were people who worked alongside Kagame. They have certainly got um, uh, many question marks to be raised about their own, uh, their own past histories. Um, uh, but I think by, by delving into what motivated them to join the Rwandan Patriotic Front, to take part in that invasion of Rwanda, to topple the regime, and then to support Kagame, uh, in the government that he set up, and then eventually to lose faith in him uh, and to flee abroad. I think that's a very interesting story, and it explains a lot about the nature of the government there and the nature of the regime that um, Paul Kagame has set up. And by giving it a, a human face, it, it becomes comprehensible, because yeah. otherwise it's just too complicated. Uh, do you think the story in any way would, would force or maybe even convince Western donors to calibrate, I suppose, their perspective? Uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Kagame regime? I think, I hope it will. Um, you're probably aware that my government has just signed an asylum processing deal in which asylum seekers who are not welcome in Britain are, are going to be sent to Rwanda to be processed in Rwanda, and the hope is they will settle in Rwanda. And I, I feel that's an inappropriate place to be sending uh, people who are fleeing repression. But I also think that here in South Africa, um, there's also a tendency to turn a blind eye to what the Rwandans get up to because there are a lot of uh, South African companies that are invested in Rwanda um, and uh, you also see a lot of people expressing great admiration for Kagame's economic miracle as it is termed and his development um, um, achievements and I think that if you look at them more closely they're not quite as miraculous as people make out so there are human rights massive human rights concerns but also there's a tendency to spin a bit of a yarn around Rwanda and I'm just trying to get people to look at that more critically yeah as you put it, I mean, you were well aware that this kind of book would trigger all sorts of, of uproar and, and all sorts of criticism. But ha have you been yourself physically threatened directly? I haven't been physically threatened, but the, the um, president went on live TV and said I was a foreign agent, uh, which was a surprise to me. Um, he said I've been paid a lot of money to write my book. Um, I, I, <laughs> I found that very, uh, very amusing. Um, but um, no, mostly what happens is that there is um, um, the Rwandans have a very effective and efficient um, troll uh, army of um, uh, social media trolls, and they reach out and sort of attack people like me. Um, very personalised attacks always, and they call me, a, you know, a genocide denier, a foreign agent, a witch. Um, endless numbers, uh, endless amounts of abuse. Um, so you, you just, I knew that was going to happen when I wrote the book and I knew it was going to happen as soon as it was published. So uh, I, th I just have to shrug and ignore it. All right, fantastic. Michaela Wrong, thank you so much for coming on. Author and journalist there of the book, Do Not Disturb, uh, award-winning author uh, who writes the story of the political murder of an African uh, regime gone bad deals with complex webs of loyalties and political intrigue in Rwanda and beyond. Coming up.